you for coming along to this talk. Uh, I'm Sarah, I'm a principal engineer at the Financial Times. Um, Financial Times is one of the world's leading business newspapers. You can't hear. Okay. This is the danger with this is it's probably just going to be in my hair. Is that better? Good. Okay, cool. Um, so, I work at the Financial Times. About two years ago, I started work on a new project there, um, building a new content platform with APIs. And we did that using a microservice architecture. So I'm here to, take, to talk about what it's like to move from monitoring a monolithic application to monitoring microservices, which is also about what it's like to start doing DevOps. Because if you're building microservices, you're building a lot of new services, and you're getting rid of them when you stop using them, and you can't take the time to hand them over to a separate operations team. And what that means is you're going to be supporting your services, and all of the pain that used to be felt by the operations team because you did shoddy monitoring and alerting is now being felt by you. So anyone that's done any support for a production system will have seen an inbox a bit like this. It's hundreds and hundreds of emails. It's very hard to work out um, why you've got them, what you're supposed to do with them, and it's just overwhelming. So the bad news is that microservices make it worse. I saw this recently. Um, microservices are an efficient device for transforming business problems into distributed transaction problems. But there are lots of things to like about microservices. I'm very happy that I can reason about what I'm trying to do because it's a very small piece of my system. And I can make changes live and roll them back really easily. And I can change the architecture. And I know when I've made that migration and I can get rid of the old stuff much more easily than I could when I was building a monolith. So that's all great. But monitoring is much harder. So why is that? Well, you have a lot more systems. In our case, we've currently got 45 microservices. They're in three environments, integration, test, and production. In our case, um, some people go straight to production, but we have got these three environments. We've got at least two uh, VMs for each of those services. We run about 20 checks. So these will be things like system checks for CPU load, whether the disk is getting full. Um, we also do some functional tests. And so we have about 20, and we run them at least every five minutes. And that means that there's over one and a half million checks happening every day. And that means that you get alerts for unlikely and transient things all the time. So earlier this year, a new developer joined our team, and he couldn't believe the number of alert emails we were getting, so he started counting. After 50 days, he turned around to us and said, you got over 19,000 system alerts. It's an average of 380 a day. And that's an average. So when shared infrastructure goes wrong, for example, if the system time isn't being properly synchronized, or if someone accidentally switched off a DNS server, um, then everything, all the monitoring for every server lights up. And as an example, I got 20,000 emails overnight because someone shut down a Puppet Master. We're using Puppet to do our deploys. Um, so you, you can't deal with 20,000 emails overnight. And it's not just system monitoring that's painful. So functional monitoring. Um, we started out doing alerts and monitoring for microservices just like we did for monoliths. So we thought, well, we'd like to know if our response time is getting slow. We'd like to know if we returned an error to anyone or if we logged an error. Um, and we set up those alerts. And in those same 50 dates, we got nearly 13,000 response time uh, error alerts. Again, it's about 255 a day. So why so many? Um, first off, when you're in a monolith, you would be calling a function. Now you're making an HTTP request. Um, there are more things that can go wrong making that call. You're not in the same VM. You're not in the same process. Also, when you build a microservices architecture and something fails, you're going to get an alert from the service that uses it. But if you're not clever about how you do alerts, you're also going to get alerts from every other service that uses it and you get a cascade of alerts. Um, and when things do go wrong, it's a bit like this. I practiced on my team at work, and apparently there's no point saying anything else to you until I move off this slide, because all you're doing is watching the dog. So 
how can you make it better? You need to be able to support your system, um, which means you need to be able to sort out your monitoring and alerting. And we knew we had a problem uh, when you look at the number. When you add all of those up, we were getting an alert every five minutes, and you can't do anything with that. So with the support of our product owner, we took some time to work on it. So we have a thing we do at the FT called Quick Start. Uh, we take a small team, and it might be from multiple different areas, different projects, skill sets, and we put them in a room together. Uh, no specific requirements, no backlog, just something, a topic of interest. Um, from the feedback, it's very important that biscuits and coffee are delivered twice a day. In this case, we focused on alerts and how to make them more useful and rescue our inboxes. And there's, there's a write-up of this process on our um, technology blog, which is called Engine Room. So I can uh, tell you three principles that we've followed to reduce the number of alerts and let us concentrate on building new functionality. So the first thing is to think about monitoring from the start. It's, uh, it's obviously easy for me to say that because we didn't. But we did get some things right. Um, what we got wrong is we created far too many alerts without thinking about why we were doing it. It was just something on the checklist, you know, code, test, monitoring. Um, the problem is you probably don't care about quite a lot of these alerts. I don't care about NTP issues in non-production environments, but I still get alerts for them. Um, and you don't care about alerts that you get because a service is passing on what happened further down the call stack. So. It's the business functionality that you care about, not the individual microservices. And to tell you about that, um, so this is, this is uh, the component on the right-hand side is, uh, comes out of our APIs, and if it's on our site homepage. And if that stops being updated, we will hear about it, whether we monitor it or not. Someone's going to appear at my desk and say, why aren't we getting this? So that's what our alerts should be focusing on. So to tell you what's important to us, I need to tell you a bit about our system. So this is a very simplified system diagram. So what we're doing is publishing content, uh, making APIs available for people to get it. So uh, the architecture, it's microservices mostly written in Java using a package called DropWizard that gives you a lot of useful dependencies. We have some Go apps as well. We're using MongoDB. We have a triple store called GraphDB. Uh, we're just introducing Neo4j. Um, and we have basically got four or five key things that we want to do. So the first thing is publishing of content. Any system at the FT that's got content, when something gets published, we convert it into a common format. While we're doing that, we also annotate that content. So we pick out organizations, people, locations that are mentioned in it to create our metadata. But to do that, we need to know about organizations and people. So we also have um, data loads that load millions of organizations, millions of people. And then finally, we have a selection of APIs for people to be able to access all of this stuff. But it's not the same thing that we care about for each of these. So when we're publishing content, we care about whether that, that article made it through. And we care about every article that fails, because believe me, if a journalist's story doesn't make it out onto the site, they're not happy. And you need to sort it out. And so we need an individual alert saying, this article needs to be republished, and exactly how to do that. From the API side, um, we have a lot of requests coming in. So we tend to look at uh, 95th percentile, 99th percentile response time. So we care about when things start getting slower, because it usually means something is going wrong. It's a useful, useful measure. Um, but we don't just care about speed. We also care about errors. Um, did something go wrong? So the obvious thing to look at is server errors. Are we returning 500 status code to everybody? Um, and this, this graph actually shows a, when one of our blades failed in a data center, and you can see very clearly the point where it happened because the pink line jumps up. Um, that triggered an alert, and we knew about it really quickly. But we also look for client errors, because if someone is making a request to us and we're telling them that it's a bad request, that might be because we've accidentally changed the contract and made things more difficult for them. And this happened. Um, we'd been letting people make post requests without specifying a content type header. We put something in that stopped that, and we broke lots of people's integration. We picked it up because we had those alerts to tell us. But it's the end-to-end -end process that matters. So within our microservices, we will back off and retry. So if you're calling another service and you don't get the right response, for quite a lot of the possible responses, you try again. And I don't really care if the first one failed, because the whole thing 
was okay. I don't want to get an alert for it. I might want to have a report, but I certainly don't want to get woken up at two in the morning for something that actually worked. You only want an alert when you need to take action. Otherwise, it's just noise. Um, your alert should be something you don't mind being interrupted about. Um, anything else, you can uh, convert into a report, a dashboard. Um, we got rid of a lot of our alerts, and it was really hard to get developers to do that because they worry about losing information. So we converted them into dashboards, which mostly don't get looked at. But it's good because they're there, and you can go and look at them if you need them. Uh, you also, once you've got to the point where you're getting alerts that really mean something, you need to make sure you can't miss it. And the problem with this is developers want to get deep into their code and be concentrating on that. And if you've got alerts coming in, you, you won't notice. So what we've done is we have an ops cop. So each week, one of the developers is responsible for responding to alerts. Obviously, it's really not a great job. It's quite boring. Um, and they can't do any solid bits of work while they're doing that because they wouldn't be, um, they wouldn't be able to really get into it. But that's, that's good because we give them small bits of work, they do re refactoring, they create tools for us. So it's, it kind of lets us also get through all of, a lot of the other things and tidying up that we want to do. You also need to make sure that your alerts are really good. Um, anyone reading the alert should be able to work out what it, what it means and what they need to do. Um, so clear language, don't be vague. Uh, add a link to more explanatory information. It's good to get someone to review the alert that didn't write the code, because in six months' time, you won't remember what you wrote. Um, you have to think about how to make future you's life easier. So um, here's, here's a search link to show you what happened. Here's, a, here's an automated job for, for dealing with this. And you need to build your system with support in mind. So what's going to make it easier for people to deal with problems? So one thing we did uh, very early on with our microservices is we make sure that we have a transaction ID. It's passed around as a request header. It's put onto every log. Um, and every microservice has to do this. So you know everything that happened as part of one event in the system. And you can search on it. So you can go and say, what, what happened here? And that lets you find exactly what you need to, to know. And we also have an FT standard for health checks. So every RESTful application, every web application, has to have an endpoint um, on underscore underscore health that can tell you whether or not it's healthy. It returns a 200 as long as the service could run the health check, even if the health check wasn't successful. And this was, this was like uh, arguments about whether you put braces on that line or the next line. It, it went on for ages, and people felt very strongly about it, and um, my side lost. Because I would wanted it to be 500 if things were wrong. But the argument is it's a 200 if the service is up and able to tell you that there's something unhealthy. And uh, yeah, you go through it. You can check. You might have several different things you're checking. And you know whether things are working. Um, it's JSON. And it has a lot of information. How can you, where can you go to find out more about what this means? Um, what's the business impact? What's the technical impact? But for humans, we have a Chrome plugin that lets you just quickly look at it. I only put the successful case here, but if it's uh, failing, there's a big red X in there. Uh, and that's, that's really nice. You can aggregate these together, so you can have one screen that's got loads of these health checks, and you can very easily see where there's a problem. So the other thing that we've done, um, we're moving towards active monitoring. So we want to know about problems before they affect our customers. And for something like content publishing, we don't publish every couple of seconds. We probably publish less than a 1,000 times a day. And there are hours where something might not be being published. But you still want to know if something's going wrong. So we publish every minute an, a known old article. So it's fine. It's real content. Um, and we republish it. And we can check whether that publish has been successful. And we know before, hopefully, we can fix any issues before a single real publish fails. So uh, the second point that we did is, is to realize that the tools are really important, and you need to use the right tools for doing this. And some of them are basic tools that everyone's going to need uh, if you're building microservices. And we were lucky in that we have an FT platform, which is an internal PaaS. 
uh, it's puppet-based, and the goal when it was uh, started was to be able to reliably build and deploy services uh, from zero to customer in less than 15 minutes. And it builds in a lot of monitoring. Um, there is some debate at the FT about whether this is useful, because if you know what you're doing, you'd much rather just go on to AWS or Heroku directly, because it's, as soon as you wrap stuff around it, you stop people from being able to do whatever they want to do. But it was really useful when we were stuck, when whole teams were starting to do this kind of thing to start with, because we didn't know everything. It was good. It's like training wheels, basically. Um, and it gave us no, some things that we needed with, with pretty much no additional effort. Um, the first one was service monitoring, and we used Nagios. Uh, it monitors system metrics, applications, services, servers. It uh, alerts you via email. Apparently, it can alert you via SMS, but thank God we have not turned that on. Um, you could acknowledge alerts to stop the notifications, and you can put servers into uh, maintenance mode. And Nagios is there as soon as we set up a VM. In fact, the first thing we normally do is set up a VM and then put it into maintenance mode because Nagios is already telling us it's not working. But, it, but it's there. And then the second thing that it gives us is log aggregation. So if you've, if you've got 45 microservices, you need to have all your logs in one place that you can search through. And, and we've got them all going into Splunk. So every VM forwards all the logs to a Splunk server, and we can run um, queries there. And it's quite powerful. Uh, you can do a lot of charting. It's very good for identifying problems. We use it to generate alerts. And we have used it to create dashboards um, in the past. Although more recently, we've moved away from that because we found that a combination of Graphite and Grafana gives us really nice uh, dashboards. It, they're quicker to write. They are significantly quicker to load, which is, is quite important. <coughs> Um, and because we're using Drop Wizard, uh, it comes with Coda Hell metrics embedded. And so all that I needed to do to start sending my metrics to Graphite was add a small amount of configuration. And then you get it in Graphite, which is ugly. You can see all the metrics on the left-hand side. These are all just the custom ones that come out of having an HTTP server. Um, but you can obviously write your own metrics. And you can create graphs in Graphite, but we don't because we use Grafana. And Grafana creates uh, really nice dashboards. And this is one of our read APIs. Um, so we can see server errors, client errors, successful requests. We can look at it across loads of hosts. Um, interestingly, I took this screenshot. And then when I looked at it, I realized that at some point in the middle of this, we swapped from one data center to another. And I have no idea why, but it's the kind of thing you can see when you've got this kind of graph. And then uh, another thing that we are starting to use is um, real-time error analysis, and we're, we're experimenting with Sentry. And this is because we were using Splunk to pick up errors, and that's pretty, um, you're, you're basically just going, is there something that was logged at error level? And it can't distinguish between an error that you've been getting periodically and a new error. And I think it's fine if you have zero tolerance of errors being logged, but in practice, you, you quite often end up with a client library that you use that for some reason logged something as an error, but you also need to see other errors, and it just gets really difficult. And we had a problem where we made a code change, it caused a big regression error, and we didn't catch it because we were already getting alerts. So Sentry would have solved that because it would tell you every time it sees a new error, we'll send you an email, you can uh, assign it to someone, you can acknowledge it. Um, and this was really easy to integrate with our applications as well. It's another configuration. You just send your logs to a Sentry server. So that's the basic tools. But you have to be prepared to build other tools to support you if the basic tools don't give you what you need. And this is easier if those basic tools have good APIs because you can create your own view on their data. Um, so our first extra tool was created by one of our integration engineers. He just turned up one Monday with it. It's called SOARS. Um, it's built by Silvano. It stands for Silvano's Awesome Warning System. And uh, it's built using Blinky Tape, which is a programmable LED strip. And each section is a different part of our system, so production is in the middle. Um, and they light up when there's a problem. So if it's red, it's uh, bad news. And if nothing's wrong, the blue lights swoosh from side to side, because otherwise you don't know whether it's just broken. But so you, we have kind of like a Knight Rider lights going on. It used to be pretty cool and run on a Raspberry Pi. And in fact, it's on the Raspberry Pi blog. Unfortunately, that died. It's now running on a Windows box under someone's desk, so not quite as cool. Um, so why did Silvano create it? Well, first of all, 
the same frustration that I have about the number of emails. You, know, you just create a filter, send them straight to the bin, you never look at them. Everyone's done it. I, I added all our product owners onto our mailing alerts list so they could work out exactly how painful it is to get alerts. They all just created filters straight away. Um, we really hadn't spent much money on any of our sort of um, monitors that we had up in our area, and they're, they're small, and you just uh, couldn't really see them. And then we tended to go, all right, we'll put up six different uh, views, and we'll loop through them. And what happens then is you see something's red, you start looking at it, it moves on to the next screen, and then you stand there waiting for the screens to come back to the one that was going to tell you something. So Silvano wanted something that was right there. You could not miss it. And it works. Um, I think he doctored the photo, because it's not that bright. <laughs> but basically, it's there, and people who aren't techies will walk past and say, is that meant to be red? Um, so you get told by everybody. So that was our first tool. So our second tool uh, addresses the problem of waiting for screens to cycle through. We want one screen that can tell us everything that we need to know. Um, and that has been done for us using a tool called Dashing. So Dashing is a Sinatra-based framework that lets you build beautiful dashboards. It was created by Shopify, and the FT have uh, adopted it and adapted it. And the, the good thing about this is that our platforms team has written widgets for almost anything that we use um, in our standard builds. So if you want to put a tile up for Jenkins builds, if you want to put a tile up for Nagios, for Pingdom, which we use for website monitoring, it's very, very easy to do, and you can make your custom dashboard. So this is the custom dashboard for our, my, my team. So we can look at this, have it up, and we know exactly where the problems are, we can dive in. Um, this is the uh, dashboard of everything. So our operations team, um, we have a kind of first line duty, operate, duty ops that respond to something's gone wrong, we don't yet know whose fault it is. Um, they have this, and if you try and talk to them about anything that's not showing up on this, they'll ask you to add it. So that means they've completely bought into this. It's probably hard to see, but the ones at the top left have a silver outline. Well, it's kind of platinum, and the ones further down have more of a gold, brown <laughs> outline. And that just means uh, the ones at the top left are more important. They have a high level of um, service availability that's required. So if things go wrong, they'll start top left, fix those, and then gradually look at the ones that are on the right. But it's, it's quite easy to see where your problems are at glance with, with that. So this is, uh, this is good, but neither of these tools deal with another problem we have, which is they're just now. So if something happened when you were in a meeting 10 minutes ago, but it's now recovered, or if something is happening once an hour for a couple of minutes, you, you can't tell by looking at that. So another member of my team wanted to do that something with that. So he created something called Nagios Chart. Uh, which gives us the last 24 hours history for any of our hosts. So it means if we have those intermittent errors, we don't miss it. And it kind of relies on your ability to do pattern matching. You can look at it and see there's a problem. So he does it by screen scraping uh, this uh, Nagios overall status page. So he just does that every minute, and he builds up a map in memory, and then he just graphs it. So it actually goes back 24 hours, because it, that's when we ran out of memory. <laughs> But it's pretty useful. So each line on it is an individual service. Um, in this case, it's all our production AWS services. And although you can't really see it, you've got the name of the service, and you've got details of what the type of check that failed. Um, and it's fairly obvious, I guess, that red is bad. So red is a hard failure of a check. Yellow is, is kind of a, a, a near miss. So it's like, it failed, but it didn't fail that badly. So you were just over the response time. And blue is when someone's acknowledged that there was a problem. So this was a large data load that made a lot of our services start to flap. And at some point, people started to acknowledge that that was happening. This one is worse. Um, our graph database fell over, and everything that talked to it went. And uh, as it was our test system, there's not much acknowledging going on. We just ended up rebooting it, getting it working. This one. The purple lines are where we couldn't even talk to the Nagios boxes. We were having uh, network issues. We, we just packet lost, couldn't get anything. And then at some point, someone did a firewall upgrade. And that's it. Everything was out for 
for hours until they rolled it back. So Nagas chart works because it uh, uses your ability to, do, to make sense of patterns. Um, and if you do look at it in your browser and you go to any of the pixels, you can jump straight through to where that error is in, in Nagios, which is good. And it's been very successful. So other teams at the FT have adopted it um, and taken it and done it for their own systems. And it's been uh, the platform environments team have taken it over. So it's, uh, it's proven, proving its worth, basically. So the final comment on tools is about the tools that you use for communication. You need to use the right channel for this. It's not email. It, it really is not email. Um, even if you get the numbers down to a manageable level, threaded view isn't good for alerts. It's hard to work out what they mean. Um, I took this screenshot. I've realized it's not actually alerts for my system. Another team copied some configuration and was sending us all their alerts. It took us four days to realize. They didn't realize at all. So it's not easy to see what's going on. Um, we've been using Slack a lot, and we like it. And it's got really good integration tools. And uh, especially, you've got webhooks so that you can call an HTTP endpoint to post a message into a channel. And it's recently, relatively recently, added email integration. So anything that can send an email can send something into the Slack channel. You can't use it for anything that you're going to send lots of, because it's really annoying. It has to be really super important things. But then it's right there in front of you. One of my colleagues tried to persuade me to put a, set up a different channel for alerts and not use the main team channel. But I think that's dangerous, because that's effectively saying, could you put it somewhere where I can completely ignore it? Um, if you get too many alerts, you've got two ways of, of dealing with that. You either tune the alert so that you don't get so many false alerts, or you fix your system, which is clearly broken. So that's, that's the choice, really. Um, one thing we're trying to do with Slack is use um, reactions. So you can react to a message with any um, emoji. And if you were to mouse over that tick, you'd see who did that. I read an article about how some newsrooms are using that to do article publishing, because they have agreed what emojis are for various stages. And you can see everything that's been done in one message. So we're trying to do this. So you know, the tick means I have fixed this. Um, if someone's looking at it, we we'll put some eyes on it. Um, it's nice. The only problem is that developers are really creative. And I occasionally have to go over to people and say, what does the dancing lady mean? Or burrito. Um, so yeah. But it's, it's, it does keep it all together. It means you don't have a long conversation about it. It's just all in one place. And radiators everywhere. So put screens up that are clear in what they're showing. Uh, you'll notice whenever things go wrong. And we upgraded our screens. We spent some money on it. And don't loop between, th between uh, different views. You just put up one screen that's always showing something, because there is nothing more annoying than have to wait to see it. So that's, that's it for tools. The final point was you can't stop. You have to keep cultivating your alerts, because as soon as you stop paying attention to them, things will start going wrong. So when you get an alert, you're obviously going to react to whatever the problem was. But you also need to review it and see whether it's any good. So if you didn't do something as a result of this alert, get rid of it. Make sure you don't get it again, so it's not going to cause you pain. See if you can improve it. So the language should be clear. You can get rid of typos. You can link to some useful documentation. Um, get your newest developer to review it, or get someone from another team to have a look at it. This is the text for an email alert from early days in our system. I really like the title, because I think it's a title only a developer could write. No, no spaces. Um, the 5M means that the alert runs every five minutes. It doesn't. Someone changed how much it runs, but their name is still saying five minutes. Um, and then in the business impact, it says, well, it might do this. Well, that's useless. I don't want to know if it might. I want to know if it has. And finally, there's an amazing technical impact section that basically covers any possible thing that this might be, the, what might be the problem. It doesn't tell me anything. So we're trying to improve our alerts. So at least this one, it's a published failure. Method is a system. It's one of our content management systems. And I know exactly which article failed, because it's there, it says. And there's a link to the run book. And the run book says, here's how you republish this. And in fact, it links to a Jenkins job where you put that UUID in, and you hit a button, and you republish it. And the only reason that you can't do that automatically is 
Firstly, sometimes it's a prob problem with the actual article. Our editors, our journalists, are very creative with what HTML they'll put into their system, and sometimes it just breaks things. And also, sometimes they're re-editing the article when we try and recover, and then that, that won't work. So we have to do it manually, but it's as automated as we can. You also need to think about all the times when you didn't get an alert. So if someone comes to tell you that something's gone wrong and you didn't get an alert, you need to think about that. So what would have told you about the problem? So this is the earlier one. Something that picked up that percentage of failures has increased would have told us what was happening, and in fact it did. Um, we've had a case where... Um, should I just miss one? No. Nope. We've had a case where integration uh, that tells us when an article's publishing broke. So we have other systems that publish to us. And because it's at the boundary, it's quite difficult because that team weren't monitoring it and we just didn't get any messages. So we talked to them and said, well, could you, could you make sure you do check that you're sending us this? But we've also added an alert ourselves that just says, have we heard from them lately? If we haven't heard from them for 12 hours, maybe, well, almost certainly there's something wrong. And setting up an alert is part of fixing the problem. So, you know, when we're, when we're fixing something that went wrong, we, we also make sure that we, we have the monitoring done. You need to make sure you would know if your alerts stopped working. We use Splunk, as I said, to generate quite a few alerts. And that means that you're looking at log messages. I um, improved some logging in one of our systems because it wasn't very good. It was not very informative. Unfortunately, I changed the words that all our alerts were looking for for publishing failures. So we didn't find out about any publishing failures for three days because they, nothing was being logged correctly. We worked this out when our data center went down and we thought, how are things still getting published? Um, so what could I have done to make that not happen? Well, maybe I should write a unit test that checks that the text we're relying on is there and call it something that even someone who's not paying attention would surely realize it's a bad idea to change these words. So, you know, basically, should include the trigger words for Splunk. And then the other thing you can do is you can deliberately break things and make sure that your alert fires. So maybe you take down one of your systems, check that the alerts you expect to have tell you about that fire. Um, or you can take part in company exercises. So twice this year, the FT has uh, shut down, well, disconnected a data center. And we've done this, we've prepared for it, we've had an agreed date, we've made sure that people are available, and we've captured everything that happened. And both times, things have happened that we just didn't expect. It's been in incredibly useful. And for us as developers, actually a few weeks before the first one, it made us think about how our system worked and realize that we had some stuff that just wasn't gonna be okay. And we knew we didn't have resilience for some parts of our system, but we found that someone had hard-coded a dependency and various other things. So it, it worked for us because it was a sudden realization that we'd be embarrassed if our things stopped working on the day. So Netflix have a chaos monkey for testing resilience by randomly killing instances and services. In fact, they have an entire simian army to test resilience at different levels. So the FT has its chaos snail. And um, apparently it's called that because it's smaller than the monkey and it's written in shell. And it runs on a virtual machine, kills the processes as root, and rec records its work. So you can do that and you basically see whether your alerts fire or not. It's very easy to use. So one final comment about this is whatever is sending you alerts needs to be more resilient than whatever it's monitoring. And that's a really easy thing to, to not work out. So in our case, if Splunk is down, it doesn't matter whether our system's up, we wouldn't know whether we were, we were, whether we were serving requests correctly, because it's, that's what tells us. Um, so that's it for me in terms of advice. So I guess the question is, what happened to our alerts? Well, we turned off all the emails from system monitoring. So we have zero emails from Nagios, and the world didn't end, it's fine. We still know what's going on, and my inbox is usable, which is great. And we got rid of a lot of our other, a lot of our um, other, um, other alerts and converted them into dashboards. Our two most important ones, the genuine alerts, they come in via our Slack channel, so we see them as soon as they happen. We have dashboards for our read APIs that tell us about response time and error rates. 
So we've made it so that we can carry on with work and not be completely overwhelmed by monitoring all our systems that we currently have. So to summarize, build microservices, because they are good, actually. They, I, I really like working with them, but you have to appreciate that it's, you need to work at supporting them, because all the complexity is now in, in the relationship between them. So think about the monitoring, things you need for monitoring from the start, and make sure you have the right tools, and then continue to work on your alerts as you go. So uh, we have a company page on uh, Stack Overflow, which describes our technologies and the way the technology department works. We've got a technology blog. We're also moving towards having a lot of our code on GitHub, and we're doing this more and more. Um, so if you want to find out more about the Financial Times, those are all good resources. Thank you.